We have uh, uh, over 200 people who have signed up uh, to be part of this. Uh, as uh, as always, uh, please keep your mics, uh, your microphones mute um, and use the chat function if you have any questions that you'd like me to uh, put to our speakers. I, I'm very grateful uh, to our, our three speakers um, who have uh, put together a, uh, a very interesting programme. Uh, Tom Gallagher, who's a colleague from St. Vincent's, is going to talk about uh, biliary obstruction, uh, pancreas cancer and biliary obstruction, and what as general surgeons we should do to work them up before referring to um, uh, a specialist centre. Adrian Sullivan from the Mercy uh, Hospital in Cork um, has posed a question that I've posed myself. I think I've damaged the bile duct now, what? And uh, Adrian, I'm, I'm very glad that you'll be looking over our shoulders uh, from now on and telling us now how on. to get out of that. Telling telling us how to get out of that. And, and lastly, my longtime friend and good colleague, Jerry McEntee from The Matter, uh, we hope we'll be able to come online. Jerry and I go back a long way and uh, have encountered uh, liver trauma on more than a number of occasions and biliary tract injury and uh, he's going to give us some very sage advice, no doubt, about how to deal with it when we find ourselves in that appallingly difficult situation. So, Tom, I'd ask you to tell us what you need from us uh, as general surgeons. We have a jaundiced patient uh, with either biliary obstruction or pancreas cancer. What do you need to know from us? Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Connell. It's a real pleasure to um, to uh, share this talk with, with the group tonight. Um, Pauline, I, I might ask you to share the slides if you can. That's great, thank you very much. Okay, so as per the introduction, um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on pancreatic cancer and malignant biliary tract obstruction, really from the point of view of general surgeon on take um, anywhere in the country. So everybody here tuning in tonight will be, will be familiar with a patient like this coming in on call. And it's really a question of where to go from the initial clinical suspicion. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, the, the typical emergency department presentation that I'm referring to here is somebody in their 60s or 70s comes in with a few weeks history, maybe even longer sometimes, a painless obstructive jaundice, typical features with that, uh, dark urine, pill stools, um, some anorexia and perhaps some bloating and diarrhea as well. Next slide, please. This is aside from the typical patient who, who might come in with, with gallstones, for example, and we're going to purely focus here on malignant biliary tree obstruction. So the, the typical feature on your initial CT that you're going to ask to get, what you might expect to see is a what we call a double duct sign. So pancreatic duct dilatation, common, common duct dilatation right down to the ampulla and your suspicion based on the history, based on looking at the patient and based on the scan is that there's either an ampullary or a head of pancreas tumour at the lower end. So what do you do next? Next slide please. The differential obviously at this stage is going to be, as I said, pancreatic cancer, distal extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and pulmonary carcinoma. You can also get duodenal cancers, gallbladder cancers, we do have the odd case of metastatic renal cell carcinoma uh, accounting for a presentation like this and malignant adenopathy as well. Uh, next slide. And what you may see on these, on these scans, and hopefully you won't, but unfortunately in a lot of the times you do, you'll see a double duct sign right down to the head of the pancreas, big distent of gallbladder, and unfortunately some evidence of metastatic disease as well. That will obviously go down one road, you'd like to biopsy that liver, get a stent in and um, 
have a, a, a frank discussion with the patient. However, there are other alternatives as well to what you might see. Next slide, please. And the most uh, favorable uh, diagnosis out of a presentation just like this would be, for example, an ampullary carcinoma, which are going to be resectable in up to 50% of cases, if not more, and once resected, have a very favorable prognosis. So it's really important at that stage to try and figure out what is causing that obstruction and not just write these patients off. Next slide, please. The majority of cases, however, will be due to a pancreatic carcinoma, usually in the head or neck of the glands. And 60 to 70 percent of pancreas cancers are in the head or neck of the pancreas. And as we said, will typically present weight loss, jaundice, occasionally cholangitis, but not all the time. And don't forget of the pancreatic duct obstruction as well, which will give you pancreatic and exocrine insufficiency with bloating and steatorrhea. Next slide, please. So pancreatic carcinoma, just to touch briefly on it, and, and this isn't the point of today's talk, but it's important to have some background, it really is arguably the most challenging of malignancies we deal with. The Irish incidence over the last few years has been rising steadily, as it has been around the world. The incidence on an annual basis between 2015 and 17 was 563. In the last three years, that's gone over 600 now. The Irish mortality for 2015 to 17 was much the same really, unfortunately, uh, with 529 succumbing each year. And that was ranked fifth in the overall uh, cancer-related mortalities, uh, quite far behind colorectal and lung, but only very marginally behind uh, breast and prostate. Next slide, please. And you'll see that what is predicted to happen over the next um, 10 years is that pancreatic cancer across the world is likely to become the second leading cause of cancer mortality in the near future for a number of reasons. One, there's increasing incidence and prevalence, but number two, the success rates for other cancers are improving and decreasing down to mortality rates, but that is not the same for pancreas, unfortunately. Next slide, please. Not only is the mortality and uh, morbidity associated with this, the, the, start, the harsh reality of pancreas cancer is that once on the day of diagnosis, patients affected with this disease are expected to lose 98% of their healthy life expectancy at the point of diagnosis. And that's something we need to, and everybody needs to be cognizant of and aware of as well. Next slide, please. However, as per my opening couple of slides, 15 to 20% of these will be amenable to resection. There is a high chance of recurrence after that resection, but we know that resection plus adjuvant chemotherapy is their best chance of uh, survival. The overall five-year survival for all comers is about 7-8%, and that's in, all, in most Western series. For those who are resected, nowadays it's hitting 25-30%. Next slide, please. As I said, for those who are resected, they are, the overall survival is approaching 25, 30%, but really over the last 20, 30, 40 years of clinical trials, we are not seeing much in the way of uh, improvement in survival, in both disease-free and overall survival for these cancers. <coughs> nice uh, graphic showing that. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is this tumor particularly so aggressive? Well, it doesn't really have any early symptoms apart from jaundice and the symptoms that we uh, alluded to earlier. It does have very early invasion of metastasis because it's a hypovascular tumor. It's thought to be quite chemo resistant. And it does have some debilitating cytokine mediated symptoms, much more so than any other comparable solid organ uh, tumor. Next slide, please. That being said, what do we do when somebody comes in with this, this particular suspicion? Number one, clinical suspicion. Number two, CT, as we've gone through. What do I mean by CT pancreatic protocol? I really mean a CT of the abdomen with an, art, uh, an arterial and a portal venous phase and one millimeter slices and an endoscopic ultrasound. You'll see I've written in the fine print for pancreatic cancer diagnosis, MRCP, ERCP, and PET. And that's one of the points I want to make over the next few slides. Really, all we want are clinical diagnosis, CT pancreatic protocol, and an EUS. Next slide, please. So 
in terms of a CT pancreatic protocol, what are we actually looking for? And in essence, this is your, your typical scan, lower cuts of the liver, aorta, IVC, where the renal vein just goes into it, just anterior to that will be your unsinate process. That's where the tumor is going to be. Just anterior to that will be the root of your mesentery with the superior mesenteric vein, superior mesenteric artery. And you want to see, is there a flat plane between the tumor and the SMV and SMA? This case in particular is upfront resectable. Next slide, please. But you'll see that the, the next slide, you can see the, there's a nice flat fat plane between the superior mesenteric artery and the tumor, but the vein is encroached or invaded by this tumor. So that is at best borderline receptacle. Next slide, please. I think it's often easier for us as surgeons and as, as general surgeons and palliatory surgeons to have schematics like this to represent what we actually mean on these, uh, on these slides. And you can see on the top left uh, image, you have a localized tumor in the unsinate process of the pancreas. You can see how as it grows, it may encroach on the bile duct, arising, leading to obstructive jaundice, and it may also equally encroach on the superior mesenteric vein slash portal vein, and eventually onto the superior mesenteric artery as it grows. You can also see how it can easily invade down into the duodenum, or if it's more cranial in nature, how it might easily invade into the celiac axis. And these are all things we're looking for, again, on a straightforward, simple CT pancreatic protocol. Next slide, please. What else do we need in addition to a, a CT pancreatic protocol? Well, for a tissue, we're going to need an endoscopic ultrasound. And the role, really, the primary role, is for tissue for fine needle aspirate. It can tell us about vascular involvement, but you'll get that on any decent CT. It can tell us about local adenopathy, but again, you'll get that on any decent CT. And the other advantage of it, you can do a concomitant ERCP at the same sitting if you need it, but I use caution on that. Uh, and I'll come on to why in the next slide. Next slide, please. So the accuracy of endoscopic ultrasound guided FNA in terms of uh, diagnosis is very, very sensitive. When you on-site cytopathology, it's up to 96%. The risks of this are very low. Pancreatitis risk less than 1%. Uh, in most centers, as opposed to ERCP. The, the sensitivity for simple biliary tree brushings for pancreas cancer is very, very low. It's kind of less than 50% less than in most centers. And you associate that then with a much higher risk of pancreatitis. And bear in mind, this is not usually just a pancreatitis that will go away after a few days, but you may get pancreatic necrosis, peripancreatic fluids, all of which will have an impact on how we look after this patient and our, our ability to operate on this patient down the line. So again, I would caution with the use of the ERCP. Next slide, please. Is there a role for ERCP? Well, this debate was ongoing in the, in the early 2000s, I suppose, and then it was the, the Dutch, as usual, did, did a trial of this, and a, really a landmark trial in hepatobiliary surgery, uh, termed preoperative biliary drainage for pancreas cancer. And they, they looked at, they randomized 202 patients all with a bilirubin of between 150 and 250. So good going bilirubin. These were properly jaundiced patients and they randomized them to early surgery versus biliary drainage in the first instance. And the rate of complications was significantly higher in those with, uh, who were uh, drained um, endoscopically uh, to the point where a number of them didn't make it to surgery because of pancreatitis. The complication rate at the time of surgery in those who were drained 74% versus 37% um, in those who were undrained and just went straight to surgery. Next slide, please. And so this has obviously led on to a meta-analysis, which was published just two months ago, again, confirming in multiple, multiple studies uh, the lack of effect or the lack of benefit of your study. Next slide, please. But really, is, the, is there just a lack of benefit? Are you actually doing these patients harm by going on and doing ERCP? You probably are. And the main group to focus in on this is actually the Birmingham group. And back in 2017, they again randomized a number of patients to either straight to surgery or uh, preoperative biliary drainage. And they found that 
the time to surgery was significantly delayed, significantly longer in those who underwent preoperative biliary drainage. But not only that, because of complications, because of pancreatitis, because of peri peripancreatic collections, etc., only 75% of those patients who were upfront resectable, remember, uh, made it to resection. Subsequent paper published last month uh, in Frontiers in Oncology followed those patients out on an intention to treat basis. And clearly, those patients who didn't make it to resection did a lot worse. So yeah, potentially you are doing these patients harm by unnecessarily uh, draining them from a preoperative biliary point of view. Next slide, please. So indications for ERCP and pancreas cancer, I have to say, and, and, and it's our practice really, routine biliary decompression is not, in, in candidates who are going to be surgical candidates is not recommended. The only indications would be if they come in and they're frankly cholangitic, in which case put in a, a plastic stent or have a plastic stent placed. Or if there's a decision made not to operate, again, in collaboration with your uh, HPP unit, or you're going to go for a neoadjuvant treatment, in which case a short metal stent can be placed. But again, routine biliary decompression is not needed. Next slide, please. So the aim of all this initial staging, what I mean by that is CT pancreas protocol plus EUS, is to determine which of these categories this patient is going to be in. Are they resectable? In which case the latest data will show that resection followed by Fulperinox will give them at best 54 months overall survival. Are they borderline resectable and subsequently can be downstaged to resectable with neoadjuvant treatment? They, those, these people are getting on average about a 26 month overall survival, locally advanced unresectable, less overall survival, and then metastatic disease. These people, unfortunately, even despite, even if they're fit for both fairness and, and aggressive treatment, uh, are still living less than a year at the time of their diagnosis. Next slide, please. So it wouldn't be a, a surgical talk or a talk to, to an audience in Royal College of Surgeons without showing off some operative slides. So this uh, was our first uh, CT that I showed you and clearly a nice fat plane between SMV, SMA and the tumour in the head of the pancreas. And you can see what you aim to do is to completely skeletonize uh, the superior mesenteric drainage of the gut up into the liver, up into the portal vein and skeletonize the artery as well. And you get a nice oncological appearance with the mesopancreas as well. Next slide, please. The next case is uh, a borderline resectable case. You can see the SMV uh, involved there, but to less than 180 degrees. So it would be deemed borderline resectable. That patient went on and had a, a portal vein resection. You can see a nice anastomosis there. Um, and again, has done very well with a proper oncological clearance. And next slide, please. You can see in the, the next case, somebody who was uh, very much questionable to begin with SMV involvement and the SMA completely encased, but had a very good response uh, to neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy and went on and had a trial resection and did have a re resection and reconstruction, both arterial and venous. So, um, you know, these cases, while they look unresectable and while they look uh, disheartening to begin with, they can be got to resection uh, with uh, the with the, the latest uh, neoadjuvant treatment we have. Um, next slide, please. So again, coming back to what can we, what can we do as general surgeons on take, taking these patients, how else why might we evaluate how we can help? So we look at the performance indicators. The vast majority of these are performance indicators that we need to look after in the pancreatic centers down at Cork and in St. Vincent's. But uh, next slide, please. You can see that there are a, a things that the general surgeon can do, which do have an impact on performance indicators and for how these patients do. So coming back again, structured imaging, CT pancreatic protocol with a standard CT thorax abdominal pelvis, and endoscopic ultrasound. Has that been done? Again, it's one of our key performance indicators. And surgery within three weeks. In our case, it's within 20 working days. Uh, after the final MDT, and what might stop that? If the patient had, for whatever reason, gone on to have ERCP and went and got a nasty pancreatitis, and we weren't able to operate on them, and that pushes them out, and that loses a particularly important key performance indicator for us, and has an impact, uh, you know, a serious impact on how these patients might do 
overall. Next slide, please. So what else, what else can the general surgeon do? I guess that it can be very frustrating while you're waiting for the MDT, for the consults, for the scans, for the endoscopic ultrasound, which obviously aren't done in all uh, centres. And bear in mind, 70-80% of these people may not be resectable anyway. Slide please. But what you can do while you're looking after, um, I'll go to the next slide please. While you're looking after these patients on the wards, they've come in on your general take, Early supportive care is really important for those patients who are clearly not going to be resectable. Uh, early supportive care in the form of palliative care has been shown in a really nice Italian study to have much improved quality of life, less aggressive end of care life and overall better pain control. Don't forget one of the first things that this patient presented with bloating, steatorrhea, abdominal pain is more than likely related to exocrine insufficiency. Have your dietitian see them. Make sure they're put on Creon, 50,000 units with meals, 25,000 units with snacks. It's something very simple to do and will lead to a very good improvement in quality of life for these patients. Pancreas cancer in itself has a hugely high incidence of venous thrombolism, more than 27%, 50 times that of the normal population. These people need to be put on a prophylactic anticoagulation. In terms of biliary obstruction, if they're going to be surgical candidates, just get in touch with us um, and we will determine whether or not they need to be stented. If they're clearly metastatic or clearly are not surgical candidates, then absolutely that biliary obstruction needs to be dealt with, either at ERCP or if that's not possible, at PTC. Gastric outlet obstruction can often be neurologic in nature to begin with. You've got to try prokinetics, um, uh, motilium, all the rest of us but it may end up coming to a laparoscopic uh, uh, gastrogenostomy to deal with that. But all of these supportive measures are things that can be looked after in the local hospital, while I understand it's frustrating to be trying to get the patient up, get them up to MDT, but there are things can be done. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate and to conclude the talk really, what can be done to improve things in Ireland? Refer the patients early. Essentially what we need is a one millimeter cut CT of their upper abdomen to see is this resectable, plus or minus the US. Do think twice about ERCP, if in doubt, get in touch with us. Um, there's always a hepatobiliary surgeon on call in Vincent and we will happily take the call at any stage. From our point of view, we always aim for our zero resections. We do dissect the SMA first. A, obtain a drop of resection margins. We always consider neoadjuvant chemo radiation, and as with all uh, cancers nowadays, we we endeavour to enrol our patients in, in registries and trials. So, uh, next slide, please. That concludes the talk. I'm happy to take any any comments or, or questions at all at any stage now, or even at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Well, Tom, as always, thank you for an excellent presentation, beautifully illustrated. Uh, there would be one or two questions, I think, that are particular to your uh, to your presentation, and then we can take uh, present uh, general uh, questions later on. The first thing is EUS, and as you know, Tom, this is really difficult for people, even um, even in your own hospital, if you're not on the HPB service, it's difficult to get an EUS. Uh, yeah, and I was thinking about this today. So in, in Dublin, there are four hospitals now have a US. There is uh, James's, Beaumont, The Matter, uh, and ourselves and Vincent's. Uh, Cork certainly have a very good US service. Uh, I'm not aware that Galway have one, but you're right. So that I can think of, there are five hospitals nationwide in the Republic have access to US. So you're right. It, 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 is a, it, it can be a limiting step. Uh, but it shouldn't be, um, and it shouldn't hold up getting the scan, getting on the phone call, or getting on the phone to us and uh, letting us organise it and making it us making it our headache. Oh, okay. Because the uh, the deeply jaundiced patient, and you're worried about what what used to be a big thing in my day was hepatorenal syndrome. This combination of deep jaundice and and the risk of renal failure. Um, yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd be surprised, I suppose, how, how well these people can do without stenting in the first place. Uh, really only stenting if they're cholangitic or if they, if they kind of, you know, very much need it. And that being said, if they are going down that road, really only a plastic stent. We've had, you know, a couple of cases of metal stents being put in and, and we're stuck at that stage because we can't get biopsies, imaging isn't up to scratch then be after that. So a plastic stent purely for decompression 
is the way to go if, if you're worried that they're septic in that way. Okay, I see there's one hand up, but I, I, if you would be kind enough to put it in chat, it would be much easier for me uh, if you have a question to put it into chat. So thanks, Tom. Uh, maybe we can move on to Adrian. As I say, Adrian, I've been exactly where you've, uh, where you've posed the question, and the question for, for you now is now what? Um, thanks very much, Warren. I'll just get up my slides there now. Um, if I just go here. Um, good. Uh, no, hopefully you can see my slides there now. Uh, perfectly. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. No, so thanks very much, Ronan, for the invitation to speak. And and I suppose we've all been in this situation. I've been there myself where you think you, you've cut the main bile duct. And I think don't think we put it as politely as I think I've damaged the bile duct. I usually think there's a few other words that are thrown in as well. So um, what I'm going to do is just talk about the scenarios that can arise during a cholecystectomy and how people can get their way out of it or stop or predominantly stop doing more, uh, more damage. So the relevance is, is that in the Republic of Ireland in 2016, four and a half thousand cholecystectomies were done, laparoscopic cholecystectomies. The relevance is, is that it's probably still one of the commonest general surgical procedures we do. And it's, it's an index training operation because the outcomes are easily measurable. Readmission rates, conversion rates, by leaks, bile duct injury, and day case uh, rates. And again, this is, this is the 2016 data from Ireland, actually. And if I can move that... Oh, sorry. I have now done something silly. Um, if, um, so if you look here, 50% of the surgeons in 2016 in Ireland did less than 20 procedures a year. That's an average one and a half a, a month. Whereas you can't, I don't know if you can see the, the edge of the slide here, I can't on my screen. But if you look here, there's only about three people in the country who performed over 100. Thankfully, I, I'm at the top end here and I do about 180 to 190 per year. Last year with COVID, that was reduced down to 130. So again, it's a volume effect. And one of the things I really want to point out is that the longer a laparoscopic procedure goes on, and if you convert it, the complications go up, the bile leak rates go up, bile duct injury rates go up, length of stay goes up. And if you convert it, and probably a true reflection of conversion rate is this 3.4% from the Chloe S study, which is a good representation of practice in Ireland and England, is 3.4%. And again, you can see everything rises, including bile duct injury. And the reason it does, and the reason why this kind of surgery for HV surgeons and general surgeons is different is because of the skills. Firstly, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it's a volume effect. I do nearly 200 a year. Secondly, we do, general surgeons these days are doing very, very, very little open cholecystectomies. If people do 20 a year, a conversion rate of 3% will take them five, six years before they have an experience of two or three open cholecystectomies. As a routine, myself, Tom and Jerry will all do expiration of bile ducts, hepatico jejunostomies, duodenectomies. Uh, colectomies, pancreatectomies, hepatectomies. We have a skill set in this area that, that is different. Fortunately, my experience in the UK um, and, and my training in the UK, I've seen and managed nearly all complications you, you can imagine uh, from cholecystectomy, and including the last one here, a hepatectomy with a portal cable shunt, um, resulting in a, in a transplant. This is a chap who had a, a major vascular injury, major bleeding from the, from the portal vein, uh, which was basically tied off at the local referring hospital. He was transferred up, myself and Nigel uh, did a hepatectomy to portal cable shunt and he was transplanted the following day. The other thing, as Tom alluded to with some of his stuff, is that there is institutional experience. We have interventional radiology. We have ERSP in the US four out of five days a week in the Mercy. And we have the equipment in theatre, T-tubes, interventional radiology, um, and, and the procedures are, are well recognised. So when it comes to major bile leak, nearly half of all surgeons will have a major bile leak during their career. And again, some, some of them are early and a third actually are late. And the cause basically is misidentification of the anatomy, diathermy injury, and a densely adherent gallbladder. And again, that leads to the first one again, mis misidentification of the anatomy. Now, this is a little video. Um, it's not a true laparoscopic cholecystectomy. This is a, a lap I was doing as part of a laparoscopic left hepatectomy. So I just want to illustrate one or two points uh, from it. First, the first thing, 
Press play there. Oh. Yeah, there we go. The first thing is that you'll see I'm using the hook. I use the hook from start to finish, and all the trainees who come with me will learn the exact same, same thing. The next thing you'll see is, is this. I don't necessarily like the term critical view of safety because I think it's subjective. Here, this is a technique I learned in England. It's called a two-window technique. You have two windows, one between the cystic duct and the cystic artery, and then a big window between these two structures and the gallbladder fossa. Now, what a lot of surgeons don't do, and again, I teach trainees this as well, is that you can see I have divided the mesentery all the way up onto the liver. And what this allows is for this space to open up with retraction this way. If you haven't divided this, this point, it's stuck down here, and you're actually working in a much smaller area. So this is a, and I do this in the front and the back, and the trainees learn this as well. It's a two, two window technique, um, and again, Predominantly with me, the trainees all learn to strip the CBD down onto the junction and clip it at the junction to prevent post cholecystectomy syndrome. So I frequently have to go back and take out remnant gallbladders with stones in them, um, which have been done, done, done previously. And you can see, so let's so skip on now. Now, so what I'm going to do, do next is, is just talk about the procedure from um, start to finish. Not finish now start to finish, okay? And, and just describe what you can do and what you can expect. First thing, when you look in, if you see this, as Kenny Rogers once said, you've just got to know when to walk away. Owen Condon sent me a picture of the one uh, here a couple, couple of weeks ago. I just said, do nothing. Get a CT and an MRCP and we'll have a look at that. And again, I would say with all of these similar type of things, they don't need a drain unless you've done a little trial of dissection and you feel like, like putting in a drain. But just walk away, do a CT scan, do an MRCP. CT to look, make sure there's not a tumour, there's anything abnormal going on, and the MRCP to look, look at the ductal anatomy prior to, to somebody else uh, somebody else doing it and just refer, refer it on. Sometimes you find after a couple of weeks of antibiotics, it settles down and it actually can look very different when you look in again. The next aspect people find themselves is moving on from that, difficult gallbladder, they've grabbed the gallbladder, the anterior wall has fallen apart and stones have all fallen out. And at the end, they've got this kind of scenario. This kind of looking at the liver bed, there's gallbladder here stuck onto the liver. This is, this is Hartman's pouch, kind of almost onto this common bile duct. So my advice in these kind of scenarios is just take out all the stones, diathermy the mucosa. Don't get obsessed about trying to close off the cystic duct. It doesn't matter. If you leave a drain in, bile will come out, patient can have an ERCP and a stent put in and there won't be a problem. If you try and put clips or an endo loop or hemlocks or try and staple this off as it is, it will do more harm than good. So sometimes actually just leaving the cystic duct alone, putting a drain in and accepting it for what it is and doing an ERCP and a stent afterwards is perfectly acceptable. Now the other place where people run into problems is aberrant right, post right hepatic duct anatomy. This is the normal anatomy here. Um, and I'll skip on over here and that sometimes the right posterior duct, right anterior duct is here, can lie superficially in the gallbladder bed. Sometimes this can be injured with diathermy um, during the procedure. These next two are common enough as well. The right posterior duct enters into the cystic duct or the entire right hepatic duct enters into the cystic duct. And again, the reason I showed the video in the beginning is that if you open up that space, You'll identify that at the time, and you can hopefully just put a clip across here or here. And sometimes, even if you if you clip this, it's acceptable, and you'll just get an obstructed duct. But the problem, what you don't want to do, is leave it leaking. Now, following on from that, we get into the into the more serious issues. Now, this 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 is a this is a right posterior duct here, and you can see a little leak in, into the into the gallbladder bed. This again is one of my own patients. Somebody had a laparoscopy somewhere else, was referred on, I had a look in, converted, and actually you can see the right posterior duct, inferior superior branches here, this is the right anterior duct, and actually I injured this myself, um, and I did repair it over a T-tube. Uh, and again, that, that just goes to show the skill set that HRE surgeons have, whereas general surgeons don't. And again, most general surgeons 10, 15 years ago were doing common bile duct expirations and using T-tubes, but now that is not common at all. And even myself, if I do an expiration of the bile duct, I don't, I don't generally use um, a T-tube unless the patient has not had a, um, a sphincterotomy previously. Now, I'm just going to talk now about the, the main or the bigger injuries. Now, 
If you follow the sequence of events, people look in, they see a ductal structure here, they assume this is the cystic duct going down to the confluence somewhere here, they put a clip on here, retract it laterally, put another two clips on and cut it. And when I talk to people after doing the oper an operation, sometimes where they put clips on the main bile duct, they say to me, oh, it was a very easy procedure. I saw the anatomy quite clearly, but actually they don't. They just see one duct, they clip, clip the proximal end, and as they pull it this way, they then see another duct, which is either diathermy through or clipped. Most people will clip it because they'll think it's the artery. And then I say, oh, did you get some bleeding afterwards? And they'll all say, oh, yeah, it was a bit of bleeding just on the liver bed. But that's actually the artery after dividing the bile duct. Now, and you can see again, this is indicit in green. You can see how this can happen. People think this is the cystic duct along here. They'll pick up here, go around it, put clips on, track it this way. Common hepatic duct is here, they'll put clips on that. Oh, that's the artery, uh, and so on and so forth. And then you get a, a resection or damage to the main bile duct. Um, this is again one of my own patients, and you can see big, this is an MRCP with IV primavist, which is excreted in the bile leak and out the drain here. And you can see a segment of a bile duct missing. I mean, this is my own patient that I, fi I fixed this bile duct, I didn't cause this. Now, and these again are some ERC pictures of, si of similar, similar scenarios mo moving along. Now, this scenario here is where someone has had clips put, clips put on and obviously they'll present with obstructive jaundice. And that's the other way people can present it, either with biliary peritonitis and identified postoperatively and identified leak at the time of the operation or obstructive jaundice afterwards. The other scenario I really want to, to hone in on, and I think this is advice for, for, for non-specialists, is that if someone has got pain postoperatively and this pain is new within 24 hours or their pain is persistent, this is a bile leak until proven otherwise. I see this over and over again. They'll have ongoing pain, they'll have an ultrasound scan, there'll be a trace of fluid, a CT scan with so similar findings. And sometimes an MRI, MRCP with IV primavis, which is excreting the bile, is useful in, in, that, in that regard. And the thing to do here is really look, think about doing a repeat early laparoscopy and washing out and putting in a drain. When you look in, if you see a little bile duct leak from the gallbladder bed, you can suture it. I tend to use 3O or 2O, 3O Vicryl actually, um, a figure of eight stitch. If after two stitches I'm not winning, I just leave it alone and put in a drain and get out. And again, along the edge here, you'll see your ducts of Lushka. Now, this is what you see. So this is fairly obvious. You see a load of bile in the right upper quadrant. First thing you do is wash, wash, everything, wash everything out and then you head towards, you know, this is, this is me, me as a HB specialist talking now, whereas a, a general surgeon, again, main thing would be to wash out, put a, put a drain in. I head towards the, the gallbladder fossa, and here you can see some fat has already stuck up there. I then actually use, I don't use regal laparoscopic swabs. I open out normal swabs and use them. I use them for two purposes. One, to retract the liver, because with all that bile and so on and so forth, um, everything is quite, is quite inflammatory and you can have a lot of tears. The other thing is that bile is quite easily seen on clean white swabs. Um, you'll see a little yellow tinge. This is the gallbladder fossa. There's no bile um, com coming here. And if I was a general surgeon at this stage, my bites would be just put in a drain and get out. Now, this lady was complicated by the fact that she had, now you can just pause that for one second. There you can see a bile leaking from the main bile duct. Now, this lady was slightly complicated because she had bariatric surgery and she had a gastric bypass. So we do not have access to a biliary tree except for a PTC. So, now, the two options here are either primary repair, and as I said, as this goes on, you'll see, you can see all the inflammation, you can see all the fat, um, and what I decided to do actually is I got a small T-tube and put a T-tube into the defect. You can see the defect there. You can say to me, could you not close that primarily? And I would say, if you had seen this before I cleaned it all up, the answer would be no, just the edges are necrotic, and I, and I think it wouldn't have worked. So I put a T-tube in, and then as you see, you might not see it here now, but I, I injected some uh, water um, in and there was a little leak from the top end. So I did put a small 4 vicryl suture at the top end to close this around, around, around the T-tube. You can see there and you can see again, you can see it is necrotic here. So it doesn't, you know, it looks okay, but it, they're actually much more necrotic than you think. So the simple principle is stop. You put in a drain. I would put in a Robinson drain, 27 French, 30 French, 
not a suction drain, because a suction drain will just suck, keep sucking the bile out. And what you want is just a passive drain. Bile will find its way out, out, of, out of a drain. So a couple of sim simple principles are, it's not mastermind. So the principle I've started, so I've finished, does not apply. Just stop. You can pause. It's not the time to feel guilty about doing it. We all feel guilty when we, when we in, do something that causes a complication, but it's not the time. You need to assess the injury, and instead of hopefully I give you a good guide about there, the potential places where injuries can occur. Aware of your own limitations is that just stop. You know, you know, if you've made a bit of a hole or you're worried about it, just stop. Don't make things worse. If you can assess and control the bleeding, then you have a stable situation and you can call for help. If there's somebody nearby, they can come and have a look at it and set us, assess it in person. Or if you just give us one, give one of us a ring, as Tom said, in his scenarios, we're more than happy to help and give, and give advice. I mean, generally transfer the patients down and sort them out. My second rule is you do not attempt to repair. Patients treated by the first surgeon have an increased risk of death, and they should all be referred early to HV Center because there's a greater than 90% uh, re success, success repair if they're done by an experienced surgeon. But however, still up to 50% can have attempted repairs by the first surgeon. And I mentioned our assessments by MRCP, CT, because 25% have associated vascular injuries, and then the management really is ERCP and a surgical repair. And surgical repair, from my point of view, is a hepatocojejunostomy. And one of the tricks of this is that you actually make the anastomosis much bigger. You just don't find the bile duct above the injury. You actually resect the bile duct all the way up to the hilar plate and do an anastomosis from the right duct, opening the left duct out towards the falciform ligament so you have a big wide anastomosis. Sometimes it's a centimeter or two um, because then you just prevent stricture rate. So in summary, don't do any harm. Don't do anything. Stop, put a drain in and phone a friend. And certainly persistent pain or, or new pain within 24 to 48 hours is a bile leak until, until you prove otherwise. And always, always, always consider just another look. Put a laparoscope in, have a look, and, and if there's bile there, wash it out and drain and phone a friend. I think that's, that's, that's everything. So thanks again for inviting me and I'm happy to take any questions, Ronan. Well, Adrian, uh, thank you also for a very clear presentation and uh, wonderfully illustrated. I, I'm afraid many of our listeners will be too young to remember anything about the Suez crisis, but Anthony Eden, of course, had had his cholecystectomy done in the UK and had a common bile duct injury, and he was British Prime Minister at the time. Yes, at the that's time, right. he was also managing uh, the nationalisation of the Suez Canal and was cholangitic, and uh, so that led to a, a real crisis and nearly World War Three. So there you are. I'm sure yeah. it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen in our country. But uh, you know, I, think, um, I, I think it's fairly simple. Do you know, if, if in doubt, just stop, put a drain in and phone a friend. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Tom would be the same. I much prefer that. And I, I, I we happily take them all up. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it, I think um, we, the, the, the skill set is different these days, say, to your days when you did a lot of, you know, gallbladder surgery, a lot of open surgery, CBD explorations. That's changed now completely, where it's a purely a specialist thing. And I think, um, you know, interesting enough, somebody phoned me there about a couple of weeks ago. They were doing, they'd converted a laparoscopic to open colostectomy, and they rang me and said, "Oh, I think, I think I'm okay. I think I've mobilised the gallbladder. I think I'm coming down to cystic duct." And I said, "No, no, no. I'll come in. I'll come in. Don't worry." And I went in anyway, and of course it wasn't. It was just a, it was just an abscess cavity they had mobilised, and the gallbladder was still, still there. And you know. But again, they didn't have a Thompson retractor out, they had nothing. So within a few minutes of putting in the retractors and, and, and positioning them appropriately, the whole thing became much, much easier. And, and half an hour later, we were finished. And I think that's the advantage of our scenarios and that we've got the equipment, we have the experience. And I think it, the patients are much better off if you just kind of stop and just say, it's not, not for me and just, and just move on. Can I ask about, you never mentioned Callow's triangle. Is that something somebody has yeah. asked, what's the difference between two window technique and the critical view of safety? Again, it's, one, it's the way I, I, I mean, that's what I was taught in, in the UK when I went there. And that, the way I demonstrated to the, the juniors is a two window technique. Um, I suppose my level of dissection there is a lot more than the general surgeon. And I think, as I showed in the video, I see the cystic duct, I see the, the cystic artery each time. And if the junior said to me, oh, we, we, didn't, we didn't see the artery or there was no artery, I say, that's wrong. You've actually just diatermined it and we will look for it and put a clip on. 
So as I said in the video, the, the technique is really to open the peritoneal folds from the cystic duct or the, or the margin all the way up, up the liver, um, like I showed in the video, so that you do have a huge amount of space between the liver. And, and the idea is that there are two structures going to the gall that, are, that cannot come back. I'm sure some of the... So I don't really talk about callus triangle or this critical view of safety. I think it's I think the critical view of safety is, is kind of observer dependent. And what one you know, some people say, oh, this is the view of safety. But you can see from my video, that's what I see every time. And the juniors are taught to dissect it at that level each and every every time and, before. And, the, and Adrian, the what on. energy source do you use? And do you use any energy before you've dissected things out? Oh, as you saw in the video, I used a hook from start to finish. I used the hook uh, but do you start. use quarterly on it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All the time. Um, and if used properly and if you teach the juniors to do it, it's not a problem. Um, when they come and they see the way we do it, uh, and I'm sure, I, you know, I know in, in UK, all the HP surgeons use the hook. I've used it all my, all my career. Um, I use it. It's about, it's, I don't know. Tommy used a hook as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think he's nodding, so I assume that's that's a yes. It, it's just, I think, Ron, it's just, you know, it, the, the key principle, I think, to doing a good laparoscopic colostectomy is to divide the peritoneal folds all the way up onto the gallbladder uh, first. And that then allows the gallbladder to be pulled out of the gallbladder fossa and the view gets much, much better. And then with the hook, I just pick all the, diet, all, all the structures off in between. If they're very fat, the, the suction it actually acts like a, a liposuction and, and you can dissect them out and the real people who, who are obese, uh, the, the best thing to use, once you've, once you've divided the peritoneal fold, is the suction because it, it works like a liposuction just, and you're left with the anatomy uh, pretty well. So okay. that's the way I've learned to do it. As you techniques. would realize, this has engendered some conversation. Um, uh, I've got a, com uh, a comment here that... Uh, uh, some surgeons don't use diathermy or hook until two thirds of the cystic plate is lifted uh, to avoid thermal injury. But again, are they HB surgeons or are they general surgeons? And I think that's the difference. Do you know what I mean? All HB surgeons in my career in the UK, I, we all use the hook like that. As you, as, you saw, as you saw in the video. What, one last thing, and, and you might know that for my sins, I edit uh, Bailey and Love, and I've just read uh, a new chapter uh, written on the gallbladder and bile ducts. And something that I hadn't uh, been aware of is Rouvier's sulcus and this um, or for you. This is a, a line between the Rouvier's sulcus and the ultimate fissure, and that you should only dissect above this. Is this something we should uh, we should tell people about? Um, yes and no. I think again that you know if I was to expand the talk and we had more time, I would certainly go into the approaches to where you dissect. And again, the rubius fissure is where that right posterior duct runs. So if you see that, you just stay above it because that 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 is your plane. Um, so I think that, that is absolutely true. That 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 sulcus is that as you look in, you see that white line. Um, you know, underneath the gall that are running across, so that that's actually the, the that's actually the right posterior pedicle going going across there. So always try and stay above that. Um, but again, so I think that's a, that's a good point. But again, not many people would have heard about it. And um, I think the, the thing, the key message is dividing the peritoneal folds. Once you divide the peritoneal folds, yeah. the peritoneal folds keep the gallbladder stuck down onto the liver. If you divide the folds, it lifts up, and your space in here gets much much better. I use the diatomy all the time. And the, and the juniors do. And I do, as I said, uh, given the data I've shown you earlier on, I was the highest performing person in 2016 in terms of not performing, but, you know, number, numbers of gallbladders, you know, 190 a year. Um, and, you know, I, you know that's, that's, that's a volume effect, you know, and the, the trainees are taught exactly to, to use the, the hook all the time. Thank you so much, Adrian. And now, Jerry, good to see you. Um, glad you could get in to join us. <laughs> Thank you, Roman. Yes. Uh, and uh, you and I have soldiered on occasion with uh, bad liver trauma. So we're looking forward to hearing your advice to general surgeons. I, I, I still recall you reducing my dislocated finger from the hepatic trauma. Do you remember that? Oh, Jerry, I can never forget it. <laughs> Anyhow, we've all, uh, we've all heard that story. I, my, my talk this evening is quite a short talk, and it is uh, my remit, I understood, was to very briefly discuss uh, liver trauma 
and the hacking and management of liver trauma. Here's your uh, liver trauma is not common. Uh, accounts for only about five percent of all abdominal traumas. And in Ireland and the UK, the majority are deceleration or crush injuries as opposed to penetrating injuries. And always remember that if they have liver trauma, they are also likely to have other coexistent injuries at the same time, be it in the chest, abdomen, pelvis, or, or in the skull. Next slide, please. Pauline, yeah. The initial management of someone with trauma coming to the ED, obviously ATLS guidelines, high index of suspicion for a liver injury, depending on the nature of the injury. And then ideally a CT, thorax, abdomen and pelvis, if the patient is stable. And if you do have a IR expertise in the hospital, and there's active extravasation of the liver, embolization. Uh, if the patient, on the other hand, is unstable from the outset, uh, resuscitation in the ED, continue the resuscitation in the radiology department, and if still unstable, continue the resuscitation on the way to the theater and laparotomy. Next slide, please. I think we'll all agree that uh, focus assessment with sonography for trauma is not appropriate in this setting. And DPL is a procedure of the past. The ideal imaging modality is CT, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. And if you're looking specifically for trauma to the liver, uh, ideally an arterial phase, a portal venous phase, and a delayed venous phase with an eye on all the other organs to see if there is any coexistent uh, injuries. If you have the expertise and the patient is, uh, and the liver is demonstrating extravasation of blood, have a low threshold for embolization of the bleed. It may buy time and it may be a definitive procedure in patients who have active extravasation. Um, not all centers will have the IR expertise, and that's, I think, what the focus of my talk was this evening. What happens if you don't have, and the patient is unstable and has a confirmed uh, injury to the liver? What do we do next? Next slide, please. The grading of the hepatic injury it varies from grade one to grade six, and depending on the combination of the extent of the hematoma and the depth of the laceration. Uh, going from grade one with a subcapsular hematoma and a shallow laceration to grade six, which is an avulsion of the, the venous attachments of the liver. And uh, next slide. Uh, management principles of liver trauma. Uh, most liver traumas are managed non-operatively, I'd say it from the outset, or with the help of interventional radiology. The contraindications to conservative management are persistent hemodynamic instability and multiple penetrating wounds to the liver or no access to IR. Uh, would you consult a HPB surgeon before you uh, undertake a laparotomy for a patient who is unstable with a, a confirmed liver trauma? I haven't had a phone call uh, about a liver trauma in this situation in 15 or 16 years. I can recall one, uh, and it's worth relating it. Uh, at about a quarter to five one evening, we were finishing surgery in the matter, and I got a call from Mullingar from the late Mr. Peter McGill, who sadly passed away last year, to say that a teenage girl had stepped out of the school bus and stepped behind the bus and was hit by a car and was now in theatre with the abdomen open 
and the liver was up in the chest and there was a fracture or an apparent fracture of the liver uh, and the patient was hypotensive. Uh, and I had the discussion with Peter and I got this brainwave, which in retrospect was a mistake, uh, that I would contact Mount Joy Station, ask the guards to bring me down to Mullingar. Uh, I contacted them. They were there outside the front door of the matter within three minutes. It was a quarter to five in the evening. Uh, they went up on the footpath, down off the footpath, over on the right-hand side, over on the left-hand side. They passed cars on the inside, the outside. And by the time I got to Mullingar, I had to run into the lobby and get sick into the bin in the in the lobby of Mullingar Hospital. We went up and the patient had an injury to the diaphragm. The liver had flipped up into the abdomen, up into the chest. On the, the two lobes had flipped upside down on the uh, falciform ligament, the narrow area of the liver, and the patient was profoundly hypotensive. And we had planned all this plan to take the liver down and repair the laceration. We had a CT image with an apparent laceration down, extending from the superior surface to the inferior surface. And when we took the liver down out of the chest, there wasn't a slightest laceration to the surface of the liver. And after about five minutes, the anaesthetist said, I think she's coming too. Uh, and the patient, within half an hour, the blood pressure was back to normal. And the sickest person that evening was myself. And uh, next slide, please. I got this sent to me <laughs> uh, during the week. Uh, they must have thought I was giving this talk today. I like it. Relax, David. It's not. A, it's just a small surgery. Don't panic. My name is not David. I know this is the surgeon. I am David. Next slide, please. So, the two uh, useful procedures are the Pringle maneuver, and I would say to you, if you're going to go into someone with liver trauma, make sure you have two suckers and two anesthetists or two assistants, ideally uh, one experienced one. Put your left hand in behind the uh, free edge of the lesser mentum through the foramen of Winslow. Uh, put the left index finger in, make an opening in the lesser mentum and apply the soft non-crushing uh, clamp, uh, the so-called Pringle maneuver. To get to that level, you clearly would have to suck out a lot of blood. We did this in two uh, elective settings just to show you. This one is the Pringle maneuver, and then I'll show you the packing again in an elective setting where there was no actual bleeding. So the Pringle maneuver is a very, very useful procedure, and anyone can do it. As I said, put your left index finger in through the foramen of Winslow, push the lesser momentum up well away from the free edge of the lesser momentum, cauterize an opening in it and take a soft non-crushing clamp and apply it across the structures in the free edge of the lesser momentum, which includes the artery, uh, hepatic arteries and the portal vein. Uh, that's number one. And the second, uh, next slide, please. Packing the liver. Uh, first step, take the cautery and divide the falciform all the way back up to the uh, upper border of the liver. And resist the urge to open the fractured liver to have a look because you'd be very shocked by the response you get with bleeding. Do not do that. Instead, take a large swab and spread it over the surface of the liver to actually keep the liver together while you're packing it. Then take at least one large swab and place it over the left lateral segment all the way up to the 
to the diaphragm. Typically on the right, it will require at least two large swabs. This is already on top of the large swab that you have holding the liver together. Then apply a large swab to the undersurface of the left lateral segment. And finally, apply at least one large swab to the undersurface of the right lobe of the liver. I don't know what they're waiting for here. You can imagine uh, in the circumstance where the patient is bleeding, uh, we'd be acting a good deal quicker than this in terms of putting in at least one and possibly two large swabs. And it may not look uh, fully compressed there, but when you bring the abdominal wall together along with these swabs, it is very effective at, at uh, stopping the bleeding. Uh, we actually, myself and, and my colleague, Mr. Keneally, John Keneally, on Monday had a situation where we were doing a posterior section resection of a, of a colorectal metastasis and we had some bleeding and it was at the end of a long day and we packed the liver and went off and had a cup of coffee for about 10 or 15 minutes, came back refreshed and uh, finished off the job. So packing the liver is a very useful procedure. Can you overpack it? Yes, you can. About three years into my 10 years that I spent in the transplant unit in St. Vincent's, about three years into it, uh, we had a patient referred to us who had an ischemic liver because in their enthusiasm, the surgeons overpacked the liver and effectively cut off the liver. And the patient had an INR of five and required an emergency liver transplantation for their liver trauma. That's basically it. Uh, the two points I wanted to focus on were the Pringle maneuver and packing the liver. Thank you. Sherry, great. Um, question for you. After packing the liver, close the midline or put in an abdominal closure device? Uh, well, I, I would have closed. You saw that one there. Uh, I would have closed that in the standard fashion. Leaving the packs inside and coming back, what, 48 hours later? 24 hours later, yeah. Or, Ronan, consider transferring the patient with the packs in, of course. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Tom Walsh is online from uh, Bahrain, and he tells us there's a simple answer to the impossible gallbladder. Simply aspirate with a laparoscopic needle and return for laparoscopic cholecystectomy when everything has got better. Any comments? No comments. All right, Tom, will you carry on? <laughs> well, <clears throat> if, I may say, if I may say so, I've done this for, on 40 occasions, and uh, it's something that the registrars became familiar with. So now, if... Um, uh, a registrar was doing a difficult gallbladder. I had no problem just looking over his shoulder and saying, "You know what to do here. Just aspirate. Don't, don't, don't proceed, and come back uh, two months later." And Tom, when you do that, would you put actually in a cholecystostomy tube? No, no. That's the whole point of it. You don't put a cholecystostomy tube. You put a little vacuum drain under the gallbladder in the subhepatic space. You can take that out later that evening if there's no. Uh, the yellow tincture uh, or the following morning and the patient goes home that evening or the following morning. Right. Well, we'll, we'll I, I don't see our experts jumping up and down to to uh, to argue with you. <laughs> OK, thank you. In, in, in fairness, uh, Ronan, I, I would say uh, where 20 years ago it was considered failure to withdraw and do nothing. Uh, that is no longer the case. And uh, lots of people uh, now would say 
this is a very difficult situation. I am not going to do anything and withdraw and and uh, address the problem at, a, at another time. And, and what I is the role that for percutaneous it, cholecystostomy, uh, or is there a role? Well, I, I don't know about Adrian or Tom or, or Tom Walsh or, or Tom Gallagher, but I, I frequently, and our hospital uh, frequently would do a percutaneous transhepatic cholecystostomy for a nasty gallbladder that was not settling within 48 hours of intravenous antibiotics. Wouldn't have okay, any hesitation just, just following at all. up on that, there's a question. What, what's the downside of leaving a Foley's catheter inside uh, the gallbladder? It's not I, a Foley. I, I, Adrian, yeah? Yeah, I think I think Tom's Tom's method is again a useful adjunct for the general surgeon who looks in and finds it problematic. We're very lucky in the mercy in that the attitude in the hospital is that emergency cholecystectomy is an acceptable procedure, and, and, and we they all get done. They're not waiting four or five days on endless emergency lists. We're lucky in that regard. So I think our first option is an operation. And I think a cholecystostomy is a very useful thing. I probably only use it in patients who are quite unwell with a lot of comorbidities who wouldn't be a suitable candidate for an emergency cholecystectomy. And again, we, I'd have no problems again, just like Jerry says, a transhepatic cholecystostomy um, and they'll get m much better very, very quickly. And that can either stand to you. Sometimes if you just do a check cholangiogram two weeks later and there's flow into the common bile duct and obstruction, you can generally take, take it out quite quickly if it's transhepatic. But I, I think, you know, again, I suppose I come from different play, place and, and, and in the hospital with Chris as well and, and Tom Murphy, uh, emergency cholecystectomy is, is the norm. You know, it, it just happens generally within 24, 48 hours. I, okay, I one that. question. What are your opinions about intraoperative cholangiography? I mean, I, I, I remember spending hours with, uh, with Paddy Collins doing uh, on-table cholangiograms. Well, it's interesting. I, 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 was a, I was Jerry O'Sullivan's registrar for a year and it broke my heart, every single one. And at the time I didn't know it, but it was part of his big paper he published in the Annals of Surgery a couple of, year, a couple of years later. So of about, of those 800 cholangiograms, at least 70 or 80 of them are the ones I did. I think the problem, the problem is that it's, I don't routinely do them. Um, I will have to be honest. And I, I think it's been a couple of years since I've done one because I think it just comes down to the way the anatomy is dissected out. I think one, it's like an open cholecystectomy. The skill of doing it, the kit for doing it, um, has changed hugely in the last couple of years, and also the interpretation. So again, I, I think unless you're doing a lot of them, I probably would say there's no point. And again, how many, how many, how many um, registrars these days will make sure that the table is turned so that the C-arm fits under the table? These, these, these are the small things that people don't know about. I mean, in the Mercy, the table is turned for my list all the time for, for a CR if it needs to come in, but I haven't done one for a while. So I, I think because they're not being performed routinely anymore, and again, if you look at the numbers of procedures people are doing, it, it's quite small. I think it may well be a dying art, and I think the misinterpretation is another aspect of it. Well, the other thing, of course, Adrian, was we, we didn't have um, MRI cholangiography in those days as yes. well. I mean, again, uh, Ronan, can I come back in here once, once more? Uh, we've got a couple of other questions, Tom. If you if you really do want to be quick, okay. The data from Germany, where seventy in from Westphalia, where seventy seven percent of fifty eight thousand gallbladders were performed acutely, the mortality was one. That's forty five thousand cholecystectomies. The mortality was one in sixty. 1 in 60 mortality. And that was because the Tokyo guidelines say, here are the options. You can do an, a convert to open, do a partial cholecystectomy, or do a fundus first. First, none of these options are easy for the, uh, the surgeon who isn't very fluent. And it, it, they take time in a sick patient. So a simple aspiration of the gallbladder uh, corrects everything. It basically reverts to Galen's hypothesis, ubipus ibi evacua. Okay. Thank you, Tom. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, the message, though, is if it's if it looks tricky, 
just, either just get out and, yeah, uh, just and 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 if it needs to be drained, either drain it your way or do a percutaneous uh, transhepatic cholangiogram. Uh, Jamie O'Reardon uh, wants to know, Jerry, you didn't mobilize the right lobe of the liver. Why wouldn't you do that in a trauma case? Most most certainly did not mobilize the right lobe of the liver and didn't <laughs> mobilize the left lobe of the liver because you actually want the ligament attachment on the right lateral side and you want the ligament attachment above the left lateral to hold the lobes in position so that the packs are more effective. Absolutely. And of course, if you have a fractured liver and you try to mobilize the left lateral segment, uh, the left uh, lateral ligament or the right lateral, you are more likely to aggravate the bleeding. Yeah, it's going to fall apart, isn't it? Um, what happens if you've got uh, IVC bleed or worse still, hepatic vein bleed? You are in big trouble. And uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the situation, you have a Pringle maneuver and then you're left with the option of applying a clamp to the IVC below the liver. Uh, and if you can mobilize the attachment above, apply a clamp above the liver. But at that stage, you are in major trouble. Uh, one last question for you all. And I think this is something that all of us as general surgeons need advice. How to deal with bleeding from the gallbladder bed? Do you use an argon? Do you spray some powder? Uh, do you pack it? What do you do? If Jerry first, if you're bleeding from the gallbladder bed after cholecystectomy. Hey, I, I, I uh, take the the cautery uh, and I if I fails to work at the cautery, uh, John Keneally, when he came, uh, I used to have uh, the soft uh, packing material and uh, John introduced me to Veriset, which is a firm uh, material. And I would put the Veriset on the raw surface and keep pressure on it for a number of minutes. And unless you have major bleeding, it will stop it. Uh, Tom, what do you do? Yeah, so very similar, but you've got to be cognizant of what, what's there. So that's the start of Cantilee's line, which is the start of the middle hepatic vein. So you want to make sure that you haven't got, got too deep into the liver parenchyma, pressure for a couple of minutes, slowly peel your swab off. And if you're OK, 90% of them will have stopped by then. But just be cognizant that there is a danger behind there. So, so the old adage that charcoal doesn't bleed is not good. Well, so, so they say. And Adrian, what do you do? Um, again, I would say the same as, as the lads. I would, I would use a hemostatic agent of some description. Um, flow seal is quite good with a wet swab, pressing it for five minutes um, and see, and that will improve it hugely. Um, as Tom says, the big danger is that the middle hepatic vein actually begins very close to the gallbladder fossa. And if uh, I think after a bit of pressure, you, you can generally either use with argon or diathermy. Generally, suturing doesn't really work because it just tear it just tears through, uh, and I just I, you know a bit of, a bit of pressure and it will stop. Thank you to all three. Uh, I think we've had a great evening. Um, we've had over two hundred people actually online, which is which is very good. Uh, we've even got the message uh, as far as Bahrain. So thank you, Tom. And uh, I just leave you with. Uh, and it's come up on the chat, but just to say that we have put together really an outstanding charter meeting. Uh, we have not been constrained by everybody having to come uh, to uh, the college. It's completely online. We have 120 speakers from five continents, and it really is uh, an outstanding meeting. And so please do, uh, to all the trainees, uh, members and fellows, uh, do register and nobody expects you to be online for the whole thing, but do come in and attend some of the meetings. And I can tell you Fintan O'Toole has done a, an outstanding Carmichael lecture. I've listened to it um, on uh, uh, public health and public wealth. And it is really something you'd be proud of on the BBC or anywhere else. It's an outstanding uh, lecture. 
So thank you to Pauline, who's been pulling all the levers in the background. Uh, thank you to Laura, Vice President, and to Porik, who have organized the series. Thank you to, to all of you for attending. And most thanks to Jerry, Adrian, and Tom for a fabulous evening. Good night and stay safe.